Okay, so good morning, Manchester. Okay, we can do better than that, I hope. This is the famous city which organized the most important of all the Pan-African Congresses. So good morning, Manchester. Okay, well, that's maybe slightly better. Maybe I know people were out clubbing last night. I don't know what happened. I'm a very softly spoken person, so I'll try to project. Okay, so for those people who didn't hear me at the back, I said, good morning, Manchester. Good morning. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> Waking up. Okay, okay. So anyway, it's my great pleasure to be here for the 70th anniversary of the famous Manchester Pan-African Congress. I was also here for the 60th anniversary of the famous Manchester Pan-African Congress. And I was here for the 50th anniversary of the famous Manchester Pan-African Congress. Somebody actually asked me this morning, was I here in 1945? <laughs> I won't point out who that person was. But I wasn't here in 1945, however, uh, in 1995, we produced this book, which is everything that anybody could ever want to know about the Manchester Pan-African Congress, including all the proceedings of the Congress, everything which happened in Manchester in October 1945 is in this book. It also contains some biographies of some of the key organisers some um, information about the main organizations and so on. So I recommend that you, those of you who are interested, uh, and it's important that we remember this history because there are many attempts to hide the history, to distort it, uh, to forget about it in various ways. And so we thought it was very important to record it. And I have to say, that those who are mainly responsible for recording this history are or were the women of Manchester. It was they who took down in shorthand or in longhand the proceedings and put together the proceedings. So we should respect all those who participated in that endeavour 70 years ago. And when I say the women of Manchester, of course, I didn't just mean the African women of Manchester. Because many of those who attended and organised the Congress in 1945 uh, were not Africans. Were the wives and friends of those who, those important people who we all speak of. So we remember their contribution too. What I'm going to do in the next few minutes is just try and present something of this history. I've got some pictures to show. Uh, we have some technical challenges. I don't know whether this very nice remote control will reach that far. So we'll see how we do. I just want to say one thing about the importance of the Manchester Congress. You probably know that before this Congress, there were four previous Congresses organised. Um, mainly organized by uh, African-American activist W.B. Du Bois. The Manchester Congress was entirely different in that it was organized here in Manchester and mainly by activists, Pan-Africanists, who were located here in Britain or had some colonial connection with Britain. I'll explain a little bit more about them in a minute. The other thing I will say, and uh, something which is extremely important about this Congress, it was a Congress which united every Pan-African or African organization in Britain. The main organization which organized it, the Pan-African Federation, was a coalition of organizations from many towns and cities in Britain, including London, Manchester, Liverpool, Glasgow, Cardiff, so all the main organisations were united in organising this event. And that's, uh, as I'm sure the organisers of this event will tell you, an uh, amazing achievement. The other thing I should explain, which I mentioned last night, is that the politics 
of those who organized the Congress was a, what I would call a internationalist politics. They were not only concerned with the liberation of Africa and with Pan-Africanism, although they were devoted Pan-Africanists, they were also concerned with the liberation of everybody in the world. And I explained last night that they also organized two what they called subject people's conferences, which were held in London immediately before the Manchester Congress and involved activists and participants from India, from Sri Lanka, from Burma, and from many other countries. So they had a very definite politics, and that grew out of the circumstances in 1945. The fact that um, they had common experiences of being colonial subjects, and also the Congress was organized at the end of the Second World War in very special circumstances. So it was very much a Congress which summed up recent history, which learned from recent history, and then looked forward to how history was going to be transformed in the future. What would it take to actually end colonial rule, or to deal with problems of racism and so on and so forth? Okay, so I'm going to, uh, let's just, actually before we move on to the next slide, let me just give you an illustration of that. If you look on the far left, I don't think you can read it, it says labour in the white skin cannot be emancipated while labour in the black skin is enslaved. So I'll say more about this in a moment, but this was the, anyway, the politics of 1945. Okay, if I can have the next slide, Mr. Slide Operator, please. Okay, so I wanted to just mention some of the main organisers. Some of them have been mentioned before. The first is George Padmore, who was one of the principal organisers of the Manchester Congress in 1945, born in Trinidad. He was, for many years, uh, one of the leading, we can say, African communists. By this time, he had a parted company with the, the communist movement, and yet he retained many of the ideas which he'd gained as a, a communist organiser. And it was he and, uh, who was, you could say, the, perhaps the principal organiser of this event, uh, certainly in political organiser of this event in Manchester in 1945. Okay, next slide, please. The second key figure is Kwame Nkrumah. And Nkrumah, in fact, had only come to Britain earlier in the year. Um, and this was one of the first major political events which Nkrumah organized. Of course, just a few years after this, he returned to what was then the Gold Coast to lead the struggle for independence. Uh, so he and Padmore were, as I say, two of the key organizers. And before this, Nkrumah had been a student activist in, in the US. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. The third in kind of importance, I would say, is this gentleman here. This is somebody who perhaps is a little bit forgotten about today. A man called Isaac Wallace Johnson. Isaac Wallace Johnson came from Sierra Leone in West Africa. He was a major, we can say, organiser of workers, a labour organiser, a union organiser trained in Moscow, as many activists were in the 1930s. His main, uh, his activities brought him uh, arrest and imprisonment. In fact, throughout the whole of the Second World War, he'd been interned by the, or imprisoned, you can say, by the British colonial authorities because of his anti-colonial and labor activism. And there's a kind of irony that at the end of the war, they not only had to release him from prison, but bring him all the way to London, which I'll explain why in a moment. He was uh, also well known for his newspaper article, Has the African a God?, which he wrote in 1936, uh, during the period of the fascist invasion of Ethiopia. 
and which was a, anyway, a, a condemnation, we can say, of colonialism. And for that, writing that article, he was arrested and uh, charged with sedition. And anyway, it was a very famous case in the day. Okay, next. And the fourth one, another very important activist in Britain, Amy Ashwood Garvey. As most of you probably know, the first wife of Marcus Garvey, uh, the joint founder of the UNIA, some would say, but certainly a major organiser in Britain from 1922 onwards, uh, a major activist during the 1930s and a key um, figure in 1945. And in fact, she chaired the opening of the first session and you saw her sitting on the uh, podium in the first picture I showed. Okay, next please. Then we have uh, Jomo Kenyatta, who'd also been a long-time activist in Britain from the 1920s, and who returned just after the Congress to Kenya, where, as you know, he played a key role in the liberation struggle in Kenya, was imprisoned uh, for his activities. In fact, while he was in Britain, he actually lived not very far away from where I teach, which is rather a strange place to live in the middle of West Sussex. Um, but anyway, he'd been a, he was a major uh, figure in organising this event here in Manchester. And here you see him actually pictured at the, at the Congress itself. Yeah, the next one, please. And this is, I had to steal this one from Getty. Uh, this is Peter Milliard. And Peter Milliard was a doctor here in Manchester, a physician. He was the president of the Pan-African Federation, which organized the event. Uh, another very important figure that people have largely forgotten about now. Um, I perhaps should explain that the Manchester Congress might never have happened. The original plan was that the Congress wouldn't be held here in Manchester. The original plan was it should be held in Paris but they decided that the weather was better here in Manchester, <laughs> and so they switched it. It was originally going to be held in September, eventually it was held in October, and in fact, they thought that it should be a small event, just a kind of precursor to a big Pan-African Congress which was going to be held in Africa. Uh, well, Liberia was one of the places suggested. Uh, but there were other possibilities as well. Uh, but that Congress was never held, and uh, so it was Manchester which took on that historic role. Okay, yep, let's go next. Okay, now I, I can't show all the figures. Uh, I haven't got a photo of, of Ras McConnan, and Ras McConnan was a very important. Uh, part of the organising of the Congress here uh, because he uh, was involved in um, local businesses, restaurants and so on and assisted not only in organising but actually looking after people who came to the Congress and so on. So he's very important but I didn't have a good photo of him so I didn't include him. But I just wanted to mention that some of the other activists who were here in 1945 and this is Eddie Duplan, who was actually from Liverpool. Or I say he was from what is today Ghana, but he operated in Liverpool. And later he went back to Ghana and worked alongside Nkrumah, organising one of the other important Pan-African conferences, the All, Af All Africa People's Conference, which was held in 1958, the first major Pan-African con conference on the soil of Africa. OK, and the next one, please. And the last one everybody knows, the famous son of Manchester. You know who this is? Len Johnson. Oh, somebody does, that's good. This is the great Len Johnson. Great, great Len Johnson, who also attended this uh, event. If you don't know who Len Johnson is, then you should find out. I'm not going to tell you. OK, let's go on. Sorry. And then the last 
uh, key organiser or key participant was W.B. Du Bois. And Du Bois had organised the previous four congresses uh, in 1919, 1921, 1923 and 1927. But he had no part in organising events here in Manchester in 1945. And in fact, Padmore and the others kept him away from the organisation. And he, in, in fact, he found out about it by accident and then was uh, honoured by being called the father of Pan-Africanism and presiding and so on. But those who were in Britain organised the Congress here in Britain. People in the US and elsewhere had nothing very much to do with it. Um, okay, let's move on because I'm conscious of time. Okay, I wanted to explain why the Congress was held in 1945 and why it was eventually held in Europe rather than in Africa and something of the politics of it. And this conference was held just a few months before, or in fact a few weeks before the Manchester Congress. And it was a conference of trade unions, of workers' organisations, held in London and in Paris. And for the first time, all the workers' organisations of the world were in one organisation. And to that conference were invited uh, union organisers, labour organisers from the colonies, from Africa, from the Caribbean. Um, and so George Padmore and the Pan-African Federation decided that this was an opportunity, since these guys, and it was mainly men, were going to be here in Europe, that they should organise a Pan-African Congress. And they explained very carefully that they wanted to hold a Congress of representatives of the masses of people in Africa and the Caribbean. They say we only want people who represent workers and farmers. We don't want professors and lawyers and these kind of people. We want the masses of the people. And Padmore actually wrote to Du Bois explaining this, that this was a new kind of Congress. He said that the working people in Africa and the Caribbean are on the move. They don't need doctors and lawyers and so on to tell them what to do anymore. So all the people who attended the Manchester Congress in 1945 were that. They were trade unionists, they were representatives of workers' organisations, farmers' organisations and so on. And so that gave it a very different flavour, a very different politics to previous Congresses. OK, next one, please. And this gives you an example of what was going on in 1945 and why they were so concerned to have representatives of workers. This general strike took place in Nigeria just a few weeks before the Congress. And it showed, it was one of the examples which showed the power of working people. That those who work are the ones who create all the wealth. And also if people stop working, countries come to a standstill. So they said, this is what we need to change the world. It's the working people of Africa and the Caribbean who are going to change things in our favour. We must organise amongst them. OK, next slide, please. So I wanted to present to you what they actually said. So there's no mistake, I'm not making it up. This is what was said. And one of the key and significant things about this Congress was that they said that if necessary, we will use force. The days of writing letters to the British government, sending delegations to Westminster, they're gone. We will use force if necessary to liberate ourselves. And this was a very important development in the kind of history of Pan-Africanism, that this was established. OK, next one, please. You can read it for yourself. So. OK, well, you can see here at the bottom this, what I said, this idea of internationalism. That they were in unity with people who were struggling against oppression throughout the world, as well as being Pan-Africanists. OK, next one, please. It's 
Thirdly, here you can see that they identified who they thought the enemy was. And in particular, they use the word, which perhaps people are a bit frightened of using today, they use the word imperialism. That they said this was the problem that they had to overcome and remove. Next one, please. You see, as I mentioned last night, they also clearly condemn what they called the monopoly of capital, by which they meant capitalism. It didn't say the way we're going to liberate ourselves is by becoming rich. They said the way we're going to liberate ourselves is by removing this system which oppresses us. In the colonies, in Britain, in the US, wherever we are. And that, they said, was this system which squeezes the lifeblood out of everybody, which you're familiar with, because you live in. Okay, next one, please. Okay, I wanted to just illustrate this point about the importance of workers because uh, Chief Kolka, who was also at the Congress, was a representative of the Nigerian Trade Union Congress and one of just several uh, workers' delegates who attended. Okay, next one please. I wanted to emphasize again what I said last night, that the uh, resolutions which they passed, the demands which they raised. One was that they condemned the imposition of colonial borders in Africa. They said, we don't recognize these colonial borders. They've been imposed on us. So they were pan-Africanists in that sense too. And as you can see here, they talked about the rights of people to empower themselves. And of course they rejected also the political institutions, the political system of Eurocentrism. The political system which we know exists in this country, but also exists in Africa, the Caribbean, the US. So they rejected that. Okay, next one please. Here you can say, see two very important statements. Uh, the bottom one, is again, they emphasize that it was the masses of the people, those who create all the wealth, that were also going to be the force which was going to end colonial rule. And they were the force that needed to be organized. And then the intellectuals, the professors and lawyers and social workers and others should join with the workers. That's how things were going to be changed. And of course, those who were the most far-sighted of them then implemented this idea, particularly somebody like Kwame Nkrumah, who organized amongst workers, women, and so on and so forth. And they identified the kind of weapons they could use. Again, based on their experience, strikes, boycotts, like the boycotts that took place in West Africa in the 1930s, the rebellions of workers in the Caribbean in the 1930s. They looked at their history, they drew the lessons from it, from their own experience, and then looked forward to how they could change things in the future. Okay, next one please. Well, you can see, you can read these things for yourself and you can see the politics for yourself. I don't need to read it out. But the emphasis was on the masses of the people. Of course, if we look at Africa and the Caribbean today, we can see that these, uh, this politics of 1945 was implemented to some extent, but not to the fullness. And so we still have all the problems that we can discuss in detail because the economic system, the political system, political institutions are, have not yet been removed. And we still have the same political systems in Africa and the Caribbean as we have in Britain, the US and so on. Okay, next one please. So this was the nature of the 1945 Pan-African Congress. I'm conscious of the time that I have, so I'm not going to show you um, more slides. 
But it's this politics of 1945, as well as those who participated in it, uh, which gave 1945 such an important place in history, which people still look at today. Just a couple of years ago, there was a big celebration for the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Organization of African Unity, uh, held internationally, and everybody talked about Manchester in 1945 that it created the, it opened the way to the liberation of Africa in particular. But we should say it opened the way. It didn't secure that liberation. That liberation is still to be obtained. But as we know, we are our own liberators. So it's our responsibility to carry on that struggle that was begun in Manchester or was articulated in this particular way in Manchester in 1945. Okay, thank you for your attention and time. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Chair. Thank you, Brother Hakim, for that um, excellent uh, review of the Fifth Pan-African Congress. Um, may I just say two things about myself. One is that Manchester is a very important place to which I used to come many years ago. I'm really glad to see uh, Mama Eloise Edwards. Um, I spent many happy hours in her, hers and her husband's place in the 70s and 80s. Um, sharing brandy with her um, Nana Bonsu and, 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 and so on. Um, and I just want to recognize him and her, Nana Bonsu, her husband, and Ron Phillips, who was mentioned by our brother earlier on, who did remarkable work in this place and whose work here uh, needs somehow, we have to find a way to explore and honor Ron Phillips' work. Um, and so um, I very much hope that on an early occasion, I will be returning to, to, to Manchester to participate in, in such an event. Um, the other thing to say is that um, I was certainly not at the Fifth Pan-African Congress, but I was born the year before it. And so I was on this earth already. Um, the other thing to say is that um, my politics began in the 1960s and it was a moment of upsurge of Marxism and of black revolutionary nationalism both on the continent of Africa in places like this and in the United States of America. So I came to politics um, accepting both Pan-African nationalism and Marxism. And there has never been, in my view, any genuine conflict between those two positions. Now, I'm up here to speak on a topic which is Marcus Garvey and revolutionary Pan-Africanism. And everybody in this audience knows that Marcus Garvey died on the 10th of June, 1940. So, am I trying a thing, as we say in Jamaica? The man did dead long time. <laughs> what am I have to do with Pan-Africanism and certainly with the fifth pack and so on? Clearly nothing. So, at the end, I want you to decide whether I was trying a thing in regard to Garvey or whether I'm telling a truth. And it's very easy for us to miss truths about significant figures. We are dealing with the Fifth Pan-African Congress. It has a history. Part of that history is before it occurred, and another part of the history is what has happened since. And I entirely endorse where Brother Hakim Adi ended. Um, there has been effectively no African and certainly no completed African revolution. And that's why we Africans are in the mess 
and it's a very dangerous mess that we are in. Now, the other big point to make is that too many Garveyites believe that Marcus Garvey was a rabid anti-Marxist and that they too must be. And it's very important that we understand, as we say in Jamaica, that not Nogoso. <laughs> Garvey had to fight communists who tried to saw the scope of his organization, tried to enter and take it over. Some of them who went in didn't try to take it over but made a contribution from within. But for it's in the nature of Marxism that they feel that the class position is fundamentally superior to all others. And Marcus Garvey was thought to be um, the ultimate misleading bourgeois organizer of black folk. And so it was the class duty of serious Marxists to organize against him for the soul of the people. Right? So Garvey had to fight some Marxists. It's important that that same man, who was no racist, recognized what was happening in the white world and acknowledged it. He recognized, for example, the importance of the Irish uprising in 1916. And there's nothing odd about that because at the start of Garvey's political life, he was in a movement in Jamaica that was very influenced by Irish developments. Also, Marcus Garvey, when the Bolshevik Revolution happened, recognized that an important development had taken place in world affairs and that working people would benefit from that process which had to be completed. And you can find Garvey saying these things. We don't understand how much Garvey documents there are. We don't understand the massive truth. Um, we don't know what Tony Martin did around Garvey. We don't know what Professor Robert Hill has done about Garvey. There are at least 12, certainly 11, volumes of this kind that contain material on and by and about Garvey, um, edited and put together by Professor Robert Hill, who is a Jamaican scholar working in the United States of America. So some words about Garvey and how he connects to um, 20th and 21st century revolutionary Pan-Africanism. We all know, should know, that Garvey was born in Jamaica in 1887. He had a very interesting childhood, had a father who had a library, unusual for, for poor Jamaicans. Um, and that father didn't say, boy, I leave my book them alone, he said, boy, I read the book then. Right? So Garvey um, obtained an important kind of education, an exceptional education. He also had a godfather who, when his father ran out of the capacity to continue his education, Garvey was taken in by his grandfather, who was a, a printer, and uh, Garvey was master of one of the key technologies of the modern era, of the, the um, post-Renaissance era, printing. The book, the printed book, before the computer, was where it was at knowledge-wise, and Garvey had complete control of that technology. Now, Garvey spent the years up to 1914, doing something that he describes in this book as going here, there, and everywhere and trying to understand the condition that black people face. And in 1914, he said, having done that, and he really had, including two years here, having done that, he said, I find that African people are in a situation of degradation, that was his word, caused by white injustice and by the failure, our own failure, including the failure of what he called positioned and educated black people, Negroes, his word, right? And he asked the kind of question that Lenin asked. First, what is the actual objective situation? And secondly, what is to be done about it? And in 1914, 
Marcus Garvey was ready to do something revolutionary about it and in fact proceeded to do so. Now, um, a friend of mine today or last night said to me that you lot are trying to put into Garvey stuff that's not there. And I said to him very gently, what, is, what studies have you done on Garvey such as to enable you to say to me that what I'm saying is in Garvey isn't there? And um, he's a good friend and a sensible man, so he shut up at that point. <laughs> 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 he shut up at that point. But it's important that there is enough material on Garvey that is very poorly understood, the implications of which are just barely grasped. So, 1914, the founding of the UNIA, it matters. The program, what is to be done, Garvey said that we had to do stuff, revolutionary stuff, in relation to our consciousness and our self-organization out of self-love. And he's talking about a people who suffered from a bad case of lack of self-love. So the reconstruction process, the revolutionary reconstruction process, involved a focus on African self-love. Love of the people of the race Afrique is what he talked about. He proposed a set of economic um, activity, uh, cooperative um, economics amongst the people. I do not say that that was in itself revolutionary, but it does matter that Africans in self-love recognize that we have remarkable capacities to self-mobilize and self-organize on the basis of the resources that we have amongst ourselves if we pool them. I'm not saying that it's a route to liberation. I'm saying it's absolutely important to do it, and Garvey recognized that, and it was a revolutionary thing to be proposing in 1914. From the point of view of Pan-Africanism, my brothers and sisters and comrades, it matters that Garvey was saying in 1914, unlike what everybody else was saying, that not that we must go to London and negotiate with these people, or to Paris, or to Portugal, or wherever, and negotiate with these people. That Garvey was saying that Africa must be liberated from colonialism and united. That was a program on the basis of which in 1914, Marcus Garvey started the UNIA, that Africa must be liberated and united. At the end of the, second, of the First World War, and it matters that the end of the First World War in certain respects was quite like the end of the Second World War, right? There had been a lot of movements. Africans were up in arms in Africa. There had been revolts on continental Africa during that war. There were revolts by Caribbean soldiers um, in the aftermath of the war. One of those took place in, 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 in Italy. It mattered that Africans in the United States of America were on the physical move away from the south to the cities of the north and that that represented a basis of, of, of social and socioeconomic transformation and so on. That moment, and it also matters that the world was full of deceptive talk about equity, about world governance, about all kinds of positive stuff like that. It matters that the forces that ran the world met to organize the League of Nations. It matters that Garvey sent delegates to, to that, into that process. And it matters that what Garvey was saying in that moment was that Africans are supposed to be the people in charge of Africa. That those colonies that used to belong to Italy and Germany should not be given to the others through some bogus mandate process, but needed to be given to Africa. It matters that a little bit later on, Garvey organized a serious, seriously funded project um, called the Liberia Project, which was about establishing a bridgehead for returning Africans into the continent of Africa as the spearhead of a process for the unification and liberation of the African continent. Now, all of that matters, and it matters that Marcus Garvey 
was in fact not one of the gradualists that my brother and comrade Professor Hakim was talking about who were around prior to 1945, but a major revolutionary anti-colonialist right from 1914. You can go and look at the pages of his popular newspaper, the, Black, um, the Negro World. Go and look at it. You will see cartoons of little ragamuffin um, saying to the whites as they ascend the gangplank of ships, we not go Africa and no, put down nothing there for come out, <laughs> right? Um, some of the stuff is actually in Creole, in, 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 in um, the, the language of, 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 of the people. And it matters that this stuff was not being s just said in an intellectual mode, but was being said as part of popular mobilization towards the total liberation and unification of Africa. It matters that, for me, one of the essences of 1945 isn't just that there were communist-trained African forces in the leadership of it. It also matters that, in that moment, what had happened was that the Pan-African movement had caught up with Garvey's radicalism revolutionary Pan-Africanism in relation to the liberation and unification of Africa. That is one of the key significances of the 1945 Pan-African um, Congress, and we need to begin to understand and acknowledge that. Now, it matters that one of the key figures undoubtedly in that conference was none other than Kwame Nkrumah, it matters that Kwame Nkrumah said in the clearest terms that I have been influenced from two reading and mobilizing sources. One, Marx and Engels, and the other, Marcus Garvey's philosophy and opinion. It matters that when Kwame Nkrumah went back to Africa to lead that process, that that is one of the fundaments of his foundation, of his progress, of his organization. Africa must unite, Africa must be free. And that was the Garveyite position. It matters that what came out of that was exactly what um, Professor Hakim Adi says, which is that the process led to the foundation of 50-odd African states. It matters importantly that almost without exception, probably without exception, what we now have is 50-odd neocolonies. It matters that the uniting agency, first the Organization of African Unity, and then the AU, are powerful expressions of neocolonialism. It matters that when Kwame Nkrumah fought for a structure to unite Africa, the OAU that emerged was not what he wanted or fought for. The OAU that emerged was precisely the one that the West, using its agents in Africa, managed to achieve or wanted to achieve. And it matters that his imperial majesty kind of went down the middle and helped to establish and gets credit for having helped to establish the OAU in uh, 1963. But the fact that his majesty was fundamental to, that, um, uh, to, to, to the establishment of that is no reason not to understand what it really was, which is that it was a manifestation of what the West really required if Africa was going to be united, this is the kind of structure that had better be there, and they got their agents to set it up in, in ways that suit them. And the subsequent reorganization into the African Union has not particularly improved matters. So, even though the process that Garvey informed, along with 
Marxist trained blacks in 19, Africans in 1945, led to an, an anti colonial revolution that, that has manifested as a system of neocolonial states, and those neocolonial states now do not in any way represent the masses that were in Garvey's organizations or the smaller numbers of people who were in the communist organization. That matters. It matters that those structures, those states, those nation states, those 50 odd nation states, are agencies of murder and exploitation on behalf of imperialism, white power. That's what they are. If you live in Jamaica, and you don't even have to live in Jamaica, you know, as a matter of fact, that that government kills, through its police forces, 200 plus people per year, shoots them down, the police in Jamaica. It matters that that same police force, thank you, my sister, it matters that that same police force with the army in 2010, killed, on their figure, cold-bloodedly, 73 people at a place called Tivoli, that on the former leader of the opposition's figures, uh, Mr. Mr. Edward Siaga, they killed that state on that occasion, 150 people in cold blood, and that on the people's account, the number is in, in the region of 250 persons that they burned and buried bodies. I was there, not that I saw any of it. I was in Jamaica at the time. I saw on the, on, on the television an army officer being interviewed by an you know, enthusiastic journalist. He said, is it true that you people buried and burnt bodies? And the man says, I am neither confirming nor deny that. But if we did it, there was a state of emergency on, and we were entitled to do anything, repeat anything. It's not true, you know. State of emergency does not cover war crimes, which is what they committed on that occasion. State of emergency doesn't give you carte blanche to commit crimes of, against humanity, right? And the same thing is happening, sometimes less dramatically, all over the world, in all over the African world. In 2012, was it? Yes. South Africa at a place called Marikana. Right? A hundred plus people shot down, 30 odd dead. Right? Cyril Ramaphosa, who used to be one of the finest mass organizers that I've ever seen. I thought, wow, that man needs to be the next president of, 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 the, of South Africa, and was disappointed when he, when he didn't succeed Nelson. But Cyril was sitting at the center of that deliberate murder of African people for no reason. They, they weren't even moving in a revolutionary way. They were simply demanding a little bit extra um, wages. So um, even if what I argue is true, and it is, that Marcus Garvey has to be factored back into 20th century Pan-Africanism, that we cannot continue with the foolishness of talking about eight Pan-African Congresses which ignore the eight that Garvey organized, most of which were bigger than all of the Congresses that other people organized. We must stop that foolishness, right? And in addition to that, we then got to take the an analysis forward. What has happened since 1945? And I've been through that to some extent already. What has happened is that because the revolution was just a revolution against colonialism, it left imperialism and capitalism, which, which some of the people, the Marxist ones of them, recognized was a real enemy, and that that revolution has not taken place. That's the difference between Africa and China or Africa and Cuba. The Cuban revolution and the Chinese revolution broke with Western imperialism, gave those people space to do real stuff for real people rather than pretending and, 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 and um, substituting idiocies round reparations for revolutionary struggle. Yeah? So, we need to understand where we are. We need an analysis in 2015 of the type that Marcus Garvey did in 1914. What is the condition that us African people face? And the answer is very simple, you know. We face imperialism primarily as neocolonialism. And then the what is to be done, defeat it or die. Because 
Africans are fundamentally, and this is not an exaggeration, right? it's not even poetic, it's just true. We face a really menacing, ruthless, deadly enemy. And you can see them in operation, right? They call it regime change. Look at what they did in Libya. Libya. No care. Look at what they did in, um, it don't matter where you mention, Ivory Coast, right? Look at what they're doing in, right, not, not a black country, no, in, in Syria. What are they doing there? They are the ones who caused the civil war. They told the opposition, do not compromise because we are going to make you win. And what they want is the overthrow of a man who was never in their pockets, even though he's himself no revolutionary. And last week or the week before, I heard on radio um, one of them saying what their real objective in Syria is, and the first time I'd heard it expressed by David Owen. He said that Syria is going to end up divided into perhaps four or five blocks. Um, one will be this, one will be that, one will be the next thing, post-Assad. Now, you hear them talking about Assad barrel bombing and killing his own people. That's in the process of a civil war, which they started. The West, be in no doubt, has no morality round the matter. Yes, thank you. The, the, the West, in these matters, has no morality round mass murder, right? In Indonesia, 500,000 communists killed by one of their, their, um, their, their dictators, army man, later di di um, civilian dictator, so-called, right? In Egypt, recently, an elected government overthrown by the army, the army proceeds to kill at least 3,000 people in the street. And Tony Blair comes on and says, we must support the Egyptian government, right? These people are deadly. They don't care about our lives. They don't care about our assets other than to make sure that we find processes to bring those assets into their hands. And everything about neocolonialism and what our neocolonial leaders have signed up to is precisely about putting those resources that belong to us into their hands. You can go and examine what our idiotic leadership has signed up to since the time of Reagan and Thatcher, since that um, neoliberal moment. And you will see that the West no longer even has to invade because our leaders have signed them the right to do this and that and the next thing, and they're taking more out of Africa now than they have ever done, even under enslavement. Yeah? We Africans have to wake up to this, right? Our movement has taken us to a point. We have to do the analysis. We face something worse than degradation, which Garvey was talking about in 1914, and carrying out the African revolution for real liberation, for real unification, and beyond that, reparations from them for what they've done to us. That's the objective. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, first before I begin, I, I, I don't live in Manchester, I live in Edinburgh. <laughs> so I came down yesterday um, to your meeting because I think it's very important and I'm off this afternoon to Birmingham where I'll be joining the Jamaicans tonight <laughs> at the Jamaican Association dinner which I come down to every October <laughs> over the last 20 years and then I go back to Edinburgh on Sunday. Um, it, it's a pleasure being here and listening to the previous speakers. Um, I'm a sort of an immigrant. I came to this country in 1955, and I was five when you're the 1945 Pan-African Congress, so you know exactly how old I am. <laughs> you can work it out. I'm 75. <laughs> um, I, when I heard your libations this morning, 
And I heard the word Pocomania because I went to a Pocomania church in Jamaica when I was a boy. So that I'm part of your active history. Um, I'm also, it's important that we were talking about um, 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 African history. It's important that we realize that as far as the Caribbean is concerned, and I know Jamaica rather well in that regard, and I think everybody here, whether they're Africans or Jamaicans, should know what this year is. 150 years after what? It's 150 years after the Morant Bay Rebellion. <laughs> and the Morant Bay Rebellion was, as you know, it was Bogle and Gordon. They both challenged the system. And in those days when you challenged the system, you were hanged. Both of them were hanged on the 23rd and 24th of October. This is the month, 150 years ago. That rebellion changed the whole attitude of the British government to managing black country. Because, in fact, they realized they had a responsibility, and that responsibility, if it wasn't, in fact, attended to in terms of the people they were governing, there would be trouble. And this is what Bogle and Gordon, in fact, showed in 1865. Now, as far as today is concerned, I don't know how much time I've got, probably not very much, so I don't want to take too long. Um, as far as my position is concerned, what I would say, whatever I've achieved, because people have always asked me that, how did you get to where you are having arrived in a banana boat in 1955? I traveled from Jamaica to, to Liverpool on my own. I was 14 years and 11 months. And people have asked me, and I, today is not a talk about that, I'm supposed to talk about science. <laughs> However, I would say that my achievement is due to um, a, a group of women, <laughs> uh, my, my mother's sisters and my mother. In fact, my mother left Jamaica in 1948 to come to London, and she, it took her from 1948 to 1955 to save 86 pounds. And she used that 86 pounds to bring me here. That's what it cost her to pay my fares to come to London from Allman Town in Jamaica. Now, if there are any Jamaicans here who know Allman Town, they will tell you they don't know, know anybody over 40 years of age who come from Allman Town. It's a very difficult part of Kingston. But it was also Marcus Garvey's constituent as a councillor. So, if you know your history, Marcus Garvey is about the area in Jamaica that I come from. So, what does it take to produce a son like myself? It took 86 pounds, because without that, I wouldn't have been able to come here. So, when people say they need more than 86 pounds to change their lives, then, in fact, it, it, isn't, it isn't necessarily true. Because when my mother, she left school at 11 in Jamaica. So when she came here in 48, the only book she could read or have read was the Bible. When I came in 1955, I passed no exams in Jamaica. I went to church. I went to North Street Congregational Church School. So again, that's the only education I had when I arrived in London in 1955. And I lived with her and my brother in one room in Haringey. And just about talking about Haringey is to interlink. When I eventually got to university, and I'm not here to talk about that, but when I eventually got to university and I got to Edinburgh to do a PhD many, many years later in 1965, I was talking to a young man who was very depressed and very worried. He had he, he was having difficulty with his studies and he wanted to leave Edinburgh. And I had 10 pounds in my pocket in 1965. And I said to him, I'm going to give you five pounds. 
And I said to him, if I were you, I would go to London. I said, I know Haringey well because that's where we, I come from. I suggested he should go to Haringey. And he did. He took the five pounds and he took the bus and he came to London. Do you know who that person was? Bernie Grant. <laughs> so this is the guy who gave him five pounds. And I used to see him quite regularly after that. And I said, Bernie, I want my five pounds back. <laughs> I never got it. <laughs> and even my mother, when she and I used to have an argument, uh, she died in 2003. She used to tell her friends in Haringey, she said, they said, Miss Ivy, where's your son? And she said, my son, she said, I don't know, he's still at school. I was the head of the brewing department in Edinburgh as the professor there. So that's not great, in fact, history, but it is what I call contemporary history in terms of how we live and how you've got to look after your children because they are the people that are going to make the contribution. My mother has made her contribution through me, and what I will do is to just say a word or two about that in terms of the scientific work I do. Now, I came, and quite quickly, I was terribly good at cricket, and I was transferred to a grammar school in London, and eventually I got a job at London University, and I was a technician, and the professor there encouraged me to go to night school. No British university would take me in 1961, but he got me into Leicester University, and I got a first degree. I got a PhD in 67, and I did research for the brewing industry, and I went back as a lecturer at the university in 1977, and I became professor in 89, and as my mother would say, the rest is history. <laughs> the point is that it can be done. And I'm saying if a, 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 a woman who can bring me here, and all she, her job was a finisher, dress finisher, and she is the person who, in fact, made a difference in my life. Not some great politics or some great uh, philosophy. It's just that she was always there when I came home in London in that time. Now, what have I done in terms of science? Because, as I said, I don't have time to go through that. I eventually, when I got my PhD in Edinburgh in 68, I left Edinburgh and I got a job at the Brewing Research Foundation in Surrey. It's not far from Redhill. There wasn't any black people in sight in those days, and no black scientists worked for the brewing industry worldwide, from California to Japan. I was the only one. And I worked for the British brewing industry in Surrey. By 1970, and you can look it up, I developed a process called barley abrasion. So if you type in barley abrasion on your computer, you'll see it. It's called abrasion, A-B-R-A-S-I-O-N. Now, I developed that process in 69, and by 1972, 60% of the beers made in the UK was made with it. I was on the BBC Life Scientific program on the 4th of August. You can look that up as well. On the 4th of August, the BBC interviewed me. And instead of the... I'm fairly well known internationally. And I've had to defend myself in the, life, in, in the Spectator, in the Spectator newspaper. If you look, type in my name and look at Spectator, you will see the argument that some guy who wrote Mrs. Thatcher's biography decided to question a comment I made that when I was interviewed for an MSc and I didn't get it, I was interviewed by Sir Keith Joseph. And he turned me down, told me to go back to Jamaica and grow bananas. <laughs> you know, he said, go back to where you come from and grow bananas. And I told him it was very difficult to grow bananas in Haringey. <laughs> <laughs> However, the point is that this is the person. I developed the abrasion process in 69, the British brewers. It was being used to produce some... 60% of beers in the UK was being made with it. 
1985, when the Nigerian government banned the import of European grain because it was costing Nigeria more money to import European grain to make beer. And the big brewers in Nigeria were Guinness and Heineken. And the story, and this is a fact, I had a telephone call from London. And I was told to come to London because the Guinness company wanted to speak to me. And I came to London in 1985. I sat with the director and he said, Jeff, we've got a problem in Nigeria. You know, we've got four breweries there. Guinness was making more money in Nigeria than they were making in London. <laughs> and I had lunch and the guy said, the director said, Jeff, you've really got to go to Nigeria. We're, we, we've got a problem. We can't close our breweries. You are the guy who knows most about cereals. So my expertise is cereals, barley, wheat, malt, sorghum, Afri the African grain. So I sat in London and I said to him, well, look, John, as you know, I was born in Jamaica and I left Nigeria under difficult circumstances 300 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I've forgotten the language. <laughs> And he said, and this is absolutely true, he said, Jeff, you're the only person in the world the Nigerians believe. <laughs> because by that time, I taught Nigerian brewers. So the, the Nigerian brewers today in Guinness and NBL Heineken breweries are my students. <laughs> the red stripe you drink are made by my students. The fullest beer you drink are made by my students. And the craft brewers around the world who bears you see, a majority of them are my students. In fact, when I got the knighted last year, I got 12 bottles of beer from London. And it was my student who worked for Fuller's Brewery who got all the young brewers in London they each put together their own beers and posted it to me in Edinburgh. And if you look on the internet, you can't say, the spectator said something about me and all my students are, are against them. So what we, you have is, I had to go to Nigeria in 1985. Now what I had to do for the company, that's Guinness and Heineken, is to see whether we could make beer from the local grain, sorghum. And I went, and I, I, we, we had a look round, and I was sent to Meduguri, which is where little difficulties at the moment. I went to Meduguri on my own, we looked around, and I came to the conclusion with a lot of other guys, we can make the beer from the local grain. That's Guinness. Eventually we did that, and when I went back to Nigeria, one of the greatest regard of my students in Nigeria for me is that they refer to their local grain as LRM, local raw material, was being used to make European beer. That to me is the kind of what we can do for Africa. As, as Africans, we're all the diaspora as I see it. So we work to help each other. And if you look at that flag over there, we don't have to give a great, um, uh, to prove Garvey's influence in Africa. That black star is Garvey's black star line. <laughs> when I go, went to South Africa to talk to the South African brewers or to talk to the, Niger, to the Zimbabwean brewers, the fact is that I was Jamaican. They, in fact, were so proud because I had the skills which, when I went to Kenya, the, 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 the Kenya brewers used to say that these are the black brewers. They say, when the German brewers used to talk to us, they just told us to pull that lever. He says, what you've done for us, you've told us why that lever should be pulled, not just to pull it. So what we need is to go from a situation where, in fact, we are the you know, the, the, the hewers of the wood and the fetchers of the water, in order to be, we are the people who are, are in the machine, so we can change the direction of where things are going. 
And yeah, I'm just done. Ten minutes. <laughs> ten minutes. OK, I've got ten minutes. And, I, and that was the Nigerian situation. We eventually, when I'm in Edinburgh, I've got a Nigerian uh, ex-student of mine, and he wouldn't leave. <laughs> He's called Dr. Reginald Agu. And if you type in a Reginald Agu, you'll find him on the, the internet. He rings me every day to check how well I am. <laughs> and he's been doing that for 20 years. <laughs> he, in fact, has carried on the work. And he's now working for the Scotch whiskey industry in Edinburgh. And in fact, I keep in touch with a lot of my students, whether they're in California, or whether they're in Japan or China. This was done by my mother, who spent 86 pounds. <laughs> So she is the person lying in her grave just outside Kingston. The point is that it is, as parents, as uncles or cousins, what I'm saying is that you give a black child a chance because you don't, we don't know the potential of anybody. And the fact is that without my mother doing that, I wouldn't have done what I've done. If you hear about the scanning electron microscope, I am the first person in the world to have used that microscope to show the structure of cereals. So we know now what wheat grains inside looks like. We know what barley grains inside looks like. And if you type my name in on the computer and you type, whether it's abrasion, if you type my name on barley, that's all you have to do. And you will get up a whole load of stuff. Um, I don't know who puts that stuff on there, <laughs> because I can just about work my phone. <laughs> but anything to do with barley research or cereals research, I'm still writing about, even though I retired in 2005 and I'm 76 next year. The point is that if my mother hadn't done that, I could probably still be in Jamaica. The point is that I was brought up with my brother in the same house. He died two years ago because, unfortunately, he was brought up in London with me, and we are from Haringey, so he got the bitter end of the stick. I was lucky in order to, 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 to get out. So I come from a, a family or a situation where I had to leave, not doing an exam at Leicester University to defend my brother in the Bow Street court because he was there for drugs. I was arrested for stealing a car in 1956 when I couldn't drive. <laughs> so you're not absolved from that kind of thing. And if you read The Spectator of last week, is where the writer, and I challenged him, and I don't, because I'm capable of doing that. He, in fact, was trying to say the Keith Joseph story wasn't true. But if you read what he's written, and I'm not saying that, I'm not making it up, his first article was trying to imply that if I wasn't telling the truth about Sir Keith Joseph, Sir Keith Joseph wasn't a paedophile. That's the obscene aspect of the way we have to live. And even in my position, I am not above that. So it shows what you've got to work against. And therefore, don't be, in fact, Anne Whittacombe, Anne Whittacombe of all people wrote a piece in my defense. And she said, you're talking to an honest man, a man who is capable of admit when he didn't know, but also a man that has contributed a lot to this society. So finally, I'm no great philosopher or great historian or whatever, but what I'm very grateful for is that everybody who has helped me throughout my life. And the fact is that you're not bright enough to defeat this system. You need every help you can get. And what I will do finally, because my time is done, for the two youngest people in the audience, that's a copy of my book. You can't buy it. <laughs> it can't be bought because, in fact, I print it myself. It is being used by schools. The two youngest people, would you come up and get it? And I'll write your names in it. I've already signed it. 
There you go. Thank you very much. And God bless you. Thank you. Yes, well, welcome to this Congress. Come on, man. Give me some love out there, baby. Oi. Yeah, especially since I'm in my hometown of Manchester. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, um, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the people who organize the conference. And let's say that, you know, that you'll see people like me up here speaking. But as per usual, it's black women who've done the work. And it's black women who pulled together this conference. So, no, 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 no. You didn't hear me. Because if you did, you would be clapping louder. I said it's black women who've done the work to put this conference on. Ah. I'd also like to, they're not here, but I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Nubian Times. Nubian Times is a local newspaper. Let me say that you know that these conferences always face difficulties. I shan't bore you with the details, but you know that when we want to do something like this, there are all people saying they're willing to help and they will do X, Y, and Z. And when the day comes, uh, you get up and the only person left is you and the mirror uh, staring back at you. And when that day came and Colette Williams was the woman who happened to stand up, Colette, because you need some recognition, my dear. When that day came, and we were looking in that mirror, and Colette was the only one there, the Nubian Times, which is three black women who are running the biggest black newspaper in the Northwest, soon to be the biggest black newspaper in the United Kingdom, uh, stepped in and filled the breach. Nubian Times, give it up for the Nubian Times. <laughs> and first, lastly, I want you to give yourselves a warm round of applause, and let me tell you why, baby. Because in the times that we are living in, African conscious people are a rare breed. And from whatever perspective you come from, and we all come from different perspectives, one of the things we heard this morning about the 1945 conference is that not everybody agreed on their ideology, but they all came together on strategy. And today we're all coming together on strategy, right? Yeah. Yes. So give yourself a round of applause for getting here. You know that? I grew, up, I grew up in Manchester. My grandfather emigrated here from the west coast of Africa in the early 1900s. He was uh, a crew. One, two. Uh, you notice the sirens are coming back again. You know that. You know that MI5 is on the case, right? Run without the mic if you don't need it. In 1945, uh, in the early 1900s, my grandfather came here. He stowed away on a boat a mer British merchant siege a ship that was leaving Sierra Leone, free town, stored away on the bottom. When he came here, they caught him and they deported him back to Sierra Leone. He was only 14. I think he was the first actual deportee uh, here in the United Kingdom. But he got back on the next boat and came all the way back to the United Kingdom. He opened, my grandfather was the chairman of the crew club. Who's heard of the crew people? You know your African history? Let me just tell you the crew people were. Before Britain and America invaded West Africa to create Liberia and Sierra Leone, who do you think that land was before it was named Sierra Leone and Liberia? It was the crew nation. And the crew nation fought against the British Army and the US Army to retain their land when it was invaded, when they wanted to create this return homey settlement. Uh, for returning uh, free Africans in America and the United Kingdom and the Caribbean. Uh, and uh, my grandfather came here, he was the chairman of the Crew Club. The Crew Club on uh, Great Western Street, which is down in Moss Side, was a seamen's club. You paid your dues every week, a bit like partner, and then when you needed help in hard times, you could go to the Crew Club and they would help you with your burial, help you with your wedding, help your child to go to university, help you when you were sick, help you when you were celebrating. That's the kind of African love that I grew up with and that I knew growing up in Manchester. My, my, my grandmother was born here. She was born in the workhouse. There can be no more ignoble start 
for an English woman's life than being born in a workhouse. It means basically you've been abandoned by your family, rejected. And the workhouses in Victorian uh, Manchester in the 1900s were akin to uh, nothing you've ever seen before. And so you have my African grandfather and this English uh, uh, woman who's born in a workhouse getting married in uh, 1920s here in Manchester. I can only imagine what reception that they would have made uh, when they uh, uh, made their appearance. Uh, my, grand, my mother, born here of course, met my father who's from Jamaica. Anybody from Jamaica house? Don't be shy now, don't be shy. You know, you know we run things in the Caribbean Sea. Now. Don't be shy. It's not, like, it's not in your nature, Jamaicans, to be shy. Uh, my father's from Jamaica, St. Catherine. You know St. Catherine? Yeah. Anybody know Boys Content in, in Catherine? I don't know. It's on the top of a hills right up by uh, 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 a Spanish town. There are several undulating mountain ranges. And right at the top, you can't even get there when it's raining, such as the state of the roads. And I, when I first went to visit there, it was, it was strange because everybody had the same surname. For reasons too boring to tell you, my name is Jasper, after my grandfather, who was uh, named, given that name uh, by the merchant seaman on the ship. So I've th got to think I've got to change that to something more appropriate for a crew nation man. But uh, my father, who was from uh, 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 St. Catherine Boys Content, when I went to visit there, everybody was named McCullough. The whole village. Doesn't matter whether you were mayor, doesn't matter whether you were... <coughs> The cook, the cleaner, everybody was named McCullough. So, any McCullers in the house? No, right, okay. Well, you know McCullough is a big... You know, in Jamaica, there are more Scottish and Irish names than, than English names. You know that, don't you? Because it was the Scottish and Irish who were sent to be the overseers in, in those places. Now, my mother's, my, fa my father's uh, mother was Cuban. Uh, and obviously, my, my father's father was African uh, and, born, and b b born in Jamaica. So in some senses, I'm a reflection of that colonial, imperial history that we're talking about with so much uh, energy uh, here today. And it's important to recognize that in terms of who we are uh, 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 as uh, a people. So uh, the other people I'd just like to name check, of course, who could, who could stand here and not acknowledge our own royalty in the form of Miss Eloise Edwards, wife of uh, uh, Nana Bonsu there. Come on now. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to ask you to do that again, but while you're standing on your feet, because she's an elder in our community, give her that love. Oh, praise is due. If you don't know who Nana Bonsu is, you're going to be in luck because there's a whole project on him online. You can just Google him and you can see the documentary of their wonderful life and commitment to Pan-Africanism over 60, 70 years. Also, people to congratulate and just to name check are uh, uh, Hartley Hanley. Anybody know Hartley Hanley? He's not here today. But I saw that boy take more beatings at the hands of the police than Mike Tyson's victims. And every time he would bounce back, sue the place. Before suing the place, police became, became even known as something we could do. Hartley Hanley was suing the police on every occasion. So he's a leader for our community. And the others I'd like to mention are Phil Martin. You know Phil Martin, right? One of our great uh, community uh, leaders opened a boxing gym uh, down there uh, on the lane uh, and uh, uh, we give him praise and Now I want to talk about Pan-Africanism today in the 1945 conference and can I just say how elevated I was for the discussion this morning between the two giant professors. I don't know about you, but I was just gobbling up every single piece of intellectual food I could gather from these two giants in their respective. Dr. Hakim Adi and Dr. Sex, Professor Cecil uh, Gutsmore. We give thanks. We give thanks for that. Now, I don't come to this position neutral, so I'm not pretending to you that I'm anything other than a left-wing activist. 
So let me just put that to you straight. You know my history anyway. So there's no point me hiding up here pretending I'm walking some middle of the road. I ain't walking no middle of the road. My convictions are clear. My history is on the record. And I'm proud to stand by that history. But for the purposes of the Pan-African movement of the 21st century, it must be big tent politics in order to work. Are you with me on that point? Because at the end of the day, as you saw in 1945, not everybody agreed in the House, but they all agreed on strategy and action. And I'm interested in coordinated action with people who are interested in doing things, not talking about uh, uh, the differences that we have, but focusing on the delivery of real concrete objectives. So uh, I'm uh, delighted uh, to be here, and uh, I, I think it's, our problem for me, and I'm just talking personally here, is we've got to move beyond the rhetoric to action. I've been in these debates, you've been in these debates, we've been in these debates, year on year on year. And we get stuck in a paralysis of analysis. Who is the authentic godhead of the movement? Who is the credible spokesperson for the movement? Who has the legitimate claim? If we'd stop talking about all sorts of differences and just do on what we already agree upon, we wouldn't be in the position that we are in today. So for the purposes of this conference, I'm hoping we can have an adult conversation. Uh, I think Dr. Umar Johnson said it right yesterday. Let's smoke out those crevices and have a conversation. But let's do it on the basis of love. Let's do it on the basis of respect. Let's do it on the basis of African values. Not some schoolboy debating society who's trying to score poppy points uh, to make themselves look good in some uh, a fake illusionary position that they have and held. I come here with a genuine desire to hear that conversation. And those of you who missed the debate yesterday, that was where that genuine conversation started. With over, what, 200 and all youths standing in the room only with a panel of all guests. You know what I like about yesterday? The, the audience led the debate. The young people led the debate. And what was their cry to, the, to, to us all? Leadership. What was their cry to us all? Action. What was their cry to us all? Give us the kind of advice and guidance that you, our elders, have in order that we can now lead in the 21st century. It's not going to be people like me that are leading. I ain't vying for no leadership position. I don't want any leadership position. Frankly, I spent 40, 30 years on the front line of racism, uh, taking on institutional racists, as you know. I want to retire with my grandchildren, write books, sit down with my family, and get an occasional call from you guys asking me for advice would be nice now and again. But the leadership is surely in the hands of the next generation. Are you with me on that point? Aye. 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 So I ain't going to be like that age-old heavyweight fighter uh, uh, who's still around trying to punch it out at 1945. No. I have earned my status at 55 to be an elder. I luxuriate in that status, and I am here to give good counsel. But the young people in the room, the future is yours. You are going to lead. I give you that leadership. We give you that leadership here today. I'm going to talk about the, uh, uh, the uh, importance now of acknowledging uh, where we are, because sometimes I think that although we're passionate about our people, we don't have a sufficient objective understanding of the nature of our condition. And that gives us rise to come to the wrong conclusion on some of the issues. Some people think everything's hunky-dory, that if you carry on working hard, you keep your head down, you do the right thing, you take care of you and yours, that everything will be all right. Some people think their responsibility for being black extends no farther than their so-called nuclear family, uh, a concept that was designed here in the, uh, in the United Kingdom. I haven't got a nuclear family. I've got an atomic family. I have nine children, five grandchildren, and one great-grandchild uh, was born last week, which is why I'm going to leave you in a little while to go and celebrate with my family the birth of the next generation of Jaspers who will be joining you in that leadership struggle. So I say that forget those concepts of familial focus around just you and yours. Your family is everybody that's in this room. Your family is every black man and woman that's in jail. Your family is the boy who's catching hell on the streets right now and you should be as equally concerned about that 
as you are as anything else. And if you knew about the objective circumstances of our people, you would have no, ob no other uh, uh, objective but to act. And what do I mean about it? Well, let's look at our unemployment rate. We've got 55% unemployment. That's one in two of our people, and that's the national average. When you go to Brixton and Moss Side, those figures go up to 60 and 70%. The national average is 55%. If there's one challenge I put forward to Pan-Africanism of the 21st century, is don't do what I did, and I take responsibility in part for this. Don't just be reactionary to racism. Going outside the police stations is important when somebody dies but if you're not building an economy that can fund black solicitors to get in there and defend us then you're only doing half the job that is necessary for our liberation you are twice as likely to die in your first year of life if you're afro-caribbean than if you're a white baby that means that inequality and discrimination starts at birth it starts from the day you were born. Everybody likes to think we're living in a meritocracy where effort and valiant effort and respect takes you through. We're living in a pigmentocracy where the skin or your color of your skin dictates where you end up and how you're going to get there. And we might have some notable exceptions. They used to say, I was one of them. Look, he made it so far above. But let me tell you, making it all the way far above, never ever let me forget that I remember being, like, unlike most back leaders who talk re some revolutionary stuff, I came out of Strange Ways prison after two years after fighting for fighting police officers. It's there where I read Malcolm X. So my antecedents and my history is clear. I came from all the way down at the bottom and we're still moving up together. I think it's important because we want to say to people that your potential is unlimited. They said I was going to spend a lifetime in jail. I remember walking out of jail and they saying to me, you'll be back. I said, not on your mother's life. Will you see me back here in out there? I'd rode Malcolm X when I was in there, and what um, resonated with me, that he was in jail, and I was in jail reading about him being in jail. And I said, if that brother can go from where he is to where he went, then I can do that too. I didn't get as far as Malcolm. There is no ego there. But I tried my best to follow his example where I could. So you can make it, young people, whatever the circumstances of your birth. But the objective reality for us is absolutely key. In the past two years, we've seen a 57% increase in the number of black youth going to jail. That's between 16 and 24, a 57% increase. Now, you and I know the figures, and they were high to begin with, right? We knew they were high to begin with. There's a 57% increase. I'll tell you why there's a 57% increase. Because on Dr. Omar Johnson will tell you, we've got the prison industrial complex, and a black youth is a commodity that is worth more in jail than they are on the road unemployed. Because when a black youth goes to jail, the policeman gets paid, the jailer gets paid, the probation officer gets paid, the architect who build the jails get paid, the prison guard gets paid. Everybody leeches off an economy in which black people and Africans are the raw product uh, for their profit-making schemes. That's why it's increased by 57%, but some people will want to say, no, things ain't too bad in the United Kingdom. Let me tell you about racism in Europe. When in, in Europe, its whole history tells you that when European economies decline, racism and fascism goes up. Are you with me on that point? It's clear as hell. You don't even have to be a historian to read that. Read the letter from the chief rabbi of Berlin in 1930s, where he describes Berlin as being the multicultural home of Europe, where any Jew can come and find solace away from anti-Semitism in Europe, where African Americans came from Jim Crow racism, escaping it, and went with their jazz artists and dancers to Berlin to appear on the burlesque stage. When they got there, they said, this is what freedom looks like. When a German's economic crash, Berlin went from a multicultural haven to a hellhole in 10 years flat. And let me tell you why that's important. 
And we're going through the biggest economic crisis we've ever seen in Europe. And you can feel the heat already coming. They're talking about immigrants. They're talking about who shouldn't be citizens, who shouldn't be here. They are prepared to allow thousands and thousands of Africans to, to drown off the seas and the Mediterranean in some macabre recreation of the Middle Passage and do absolutely nothing to stop them. And you know what's worse? We ain't doing enough to put our foot on the throat of government to say you must respond and if they don't then we've got to find the money to find the boats to find the food to find the energy to take care of those people or else what you see happen to the least of us will happen to all of us in good time we got more black men in uh, in prison than university you know, yeah, yeah, gotcha. this is a fact for uh, Dr. Umar Johnson. Because per head of 1,000 population, Britain jails more people per 1,000 head of black people than the United States of America. We are now, when it comes to black people, the leading nation in the world for the incarceration of our people. I bet not many, many people knew that. But what I'm saying to you is if you don't have the objective facts, you will come to the like wrong conclusion. You're likely to come to the wrong strategy. But if you know the reality and the objective fact of our condition, then you'll make a decision informed by that that allow you to make strategic decisions going forward uh, in the future. So I just want to say that, the, uh, you know, when you look at what's happening across Europe, the far right and people, and I'm winding up, Chair, because I know I'm going over time, the far right, including people, these are not people who are saying, um, I'm a right-wing Tory. These are people saying, I'm a racist, I'm a supremacist, I'm glad about it, and they're getting elected. <coughs> Marie Le Pen in, Marine Le Pen in France, 25%, I think, is her current uh, electoral standing. She is in a heartbeat of winning the French presidency. You look at Greek dawn in Greece. They're running around chasing African migrants out of Athens and elsewhere, racially attacking them, burning down African hostels and throwing them into the sea. And yet we're here thinking that something that's happened one hour away is somehow less important than what happens in Baltimore or what happens in Brooklyn. Hell, you've got hell right here on your doorstep. You need to be concerned what's happening in America, but not at the expense of people who are less than an hour away from you who are facing the only hell uh, that white supremacy can endure and inflict on our people. So we've got to have a comprehensive understanding. We want pan-Africanism. What about the 22 million Africans in Europe? They don't speak English, most of them. 80% of them haven't got passports. You think you're all right because you've got one. Do you think that white supremacist Europe, as the economy declines, is going to extend their passports to the 80% or think about taking away your 20%? Because the Home Secretary has already given herself the power to decide who is a good and proper citizen to have a passport. Who do you think is going to have their passports taken away uh, from them? It's not going to be the white middle Bulling Bullingdon club boys from Eton and Oxford. It's going to be you and I. And you know it's happening. Because if you commit a crime and you were born in Jamaica and you came here in week, a week after being born and you commit a crime here, you're being deported even if you've lived here for 40 years. That's happening right now to our people. And yet we think that everything is all right in this country. It's not all right in this country. I'm really to ring the alarm and I'm saying to us that as we go forward we have to come together in unprecedented numbers I might not agree with everybody in this room and you may not agree with some things I say but I believe in my principles but you hear what we can come together on the things that we need to do I believe we need black schools do you need we need black schools yes all right but there's one thing that we agree on I believe I believe we need a black economy. Do you believe we need a black economy? All right, there's one thing we agree on. I believe that black men should respect black women and give them their role. Do you believe that? I believe that. I believe that black youth are our future and dusty old Negroes at my age need to step aside and give them some room to leave. Do you believe that? Then I believe that and we can work it together. So, time is up. Time is up, time is up, because you know, you know, hop, 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 easy, easy, Arkrook. You know, you know I can talk 
for Olympic gold standard. But time doesn't allow me. But today, I hope that we see that coming out of this conference with the PAC Foundation and the new unity that I want young people to lead, young people to come forward, black women to come forward. Please, we need you now, we'll need you in the future. As we look to the future, it is time to have resources to protect ourselves and, if necessary, leave this country. I don't think we should rule that out because our parents left Jamaica when it got held to come here. Right? And if we have to leave here again, then there's only one place we should be heading, back to the African continent. Thank you very much. I gave you teeth, my dusty <laughs> I was going to go last, but then Lee jeeved me up and I don't know, I'm going to have to follow him. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, did I say black men? Did I oh, oh. Sister, elder, I'm going to come to that. It's actually in my speech. Yeah, right, make it up. <sighs> I'd like to ask you all to stand, please. And take a minute's silence for all the young men that have died this year and all of those brothers who have lost their lives to the criminal justice system, to uh, these other concentration camps that are called hospitals and all the rest of it. So for one minute silence, please. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Colette and the rest of her colleagues for making the supreme effort to organize this event. <clears throat> for me personally, um, it's an opportunity to cleanse coming from, from the front line, from the battlefield and reflect, uh, be amongst my brothers and sisters, speak openly and honestly, and, and also speak from a personal perspective. I'm hoping that I'll get recharged in order to return to the struggle. I want to, I want to formally commit to supporting Call it in the team in ensuring that next year's event is reflective of the ambitious vision they have set for its growth over the next five years. I think it's very important. I, I want to put it on record that I'm, I'm, uh, my intention is to, to financially commit to the organization that sponsored the event so that we have it every year. I got permission of my 15-year-old daughter on WhatsApp this morning to, to spend her money. It's so important that we have somewhere to gather periodically to, to recharge and refocus and to draw strength, especially those of us who are operating way out in the front line, um, behind enemy lines, in isolation, it's critically important that we have somewhere like this to come to and that we know it's going to be there for us to come to it on a regular basis. So that's why, for me, it's critically important for me to put some money into making sure that's happen happening. And it's why it's important for all of you here to do the same.
I don't know, Colette, I mean, I, I want to speak to the sister before I uh, travel back, but she hasn't already set up um, the resource to begin gathering up that money now and to make sure that that's done and help her to draw them funds in. Because we're, we're a rich community, we're not poor. Yeah. Do you hear what I'm saying? We're a rich community, we're not poor. So. I want to thank God and the ancestors and all those who laid down their lives so that we can have our our life today. I'm a Pan-Africanist, first and foremost. Uh, don't be mistaken by the suit. They don't get more radical than me. <laughs> Ask the elders in the room, particularly the sister, for permission to speak honestly and openly with my family. Thank you. All right, so let me just tell you where I'm coming from personally. I thought I had an hour, I've only got 20 minutes, so I'm going to chop into this. I used to go to a black bookshop on West Green Road in Tottenham, Haringey, to get my food. Right? That's where I learned about Garveyism. I used to sit down and listen to them elders talk for hours and they could chat. And they'd say, when they're done, maybe an hour or two hour of chatting, say, this book, go and read this book. Irritated Genie, go and read that. 2000 Seasons, go and read that. Chancellor Williams, go and read that. And I'd come back and I'd ask questions and I'd get my schooling. Do you hear where I'm coming from? My bookshop's not there anymore. So where did the youths get their schooling? Even if they can go and pick up the information on YouTube, who do they go to sit down with and reason? When they see these things and it makes them angry and raging, who do they go and sit down with to school them and enable them to channel that energy? When they go back into the school, looking at the teacher, thinking all kinds of things, and the teacher can see in their face and tell them to come out the class, come out the school, who's there to reason with them? Teach them strategy, and how to be more dynamic. Where, where, where are they? Where are these people? It wasn't my parents that taught me about black consciousness. They were country Jamaicans. My mum was from Cuba. Um, and for them, it was just really simply about work. Um, you know, they came to the mother country um, to make a life for themselves here. And they very quickly realized that it wasn't a mother's country. It was another kind of hell. My dad worked at um, the Ford factory in Dagnum during the night um, and at Fridays he went out fighting with the teddy boys and drinking with his friends. They were simple people. I'm going to tell you about my dad though. He was a king in his home. We'd be making up all kinds of noise until he'd come in and then everybody was quiet. And once he'd park up on that city, you know, everything had to settle down. And he was, a, he was a giant amongst his friends. He was always a very sharp dresser. We used to get our suits tailor-made, trousers and everything from 11, 12. I used to go in the wardrobe and look at his suits and think about when I would be old enough and big enough and broad enough to wear one of them two-tone suits. But I noticed when he was around the white man, he seemed somehow shorter. He... He, his, his confidence wasn't there. I didn't know it as a child at the time, but something weren't right. It didn't feel right. 
I didn't know at the time I was being schooled just by observing my dad's interaction with the white man to be subservient to. Before I was even conscious of my own identity, just my very love for this man, I called him like the black Captain Kirk because I was into Star Trek. Nobody could trouble my dad. But whenever he's around these men, it's like his power was drained away. Now, who's to know that I wouldn't have just gone on, got a career, got a job, kept my head down? But that's not what God and the ancestors had for me. God works in very mysterious ways. At three years of age, my mum was taking me to the childminder, a white woman. They bring me to the door. Days like this, I remember. Because the brain's funny, trained psychotherapist, by the way. It picks specific things that it holds on to. And it, remind, it becomes the symbol of that whole experience. You hear what I'm saying? And just like many of us who understand you know, where our African roots come from, it's not numerical time that we're running on. It's event-based time. And so I remember one particular incident. My mum's bringing me to the door and I'm crying and I'm pulling away and she's, she needs to get to work. One of her three jobs. And the woman comes to the door. Hello, Viv, you all right? Come in. I'm pulling away. My mum's like, oh, she feels guilt. She's torn. And the woman's like, oh, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with him. He'll be all right once you've gone. I come in. The door is shut. Shut up! You little nigger. I had one little plastic toy and her son had an army of them. I loved that toy. It's the only one I had. It's the only one they could afford for me. And her son took it from me. I took it back. She came, she held me by my hands and let me hit me in my stomach. And then she made me eat his shit and her shit off the floor. And while I was eating the shit, she was saying, that's all you're worth, you little nigger. I'm not, tell I'm not telling this story to make people angry or nothing. What I'm trying to explain here is we have to understand, we have to be able to embrace our own shame and our own pain if we're actually going to be able to do anything of substance for our young men and women who are in a similar pain, carrying similar shame. I don't know how long it went on for, because as I said, especially as a child, you don't check time like that. But you probably have checked, like, probably about a year. I went on to primary school, and the shame of it, because I've got my, my, my dad as my benchmark, was too great, so the, 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 the brain buried it. It's like it never happened. I went about my activities. At seven years of age, it came back as a memory. It could have been a trigger, it could have been a smell, it could have been a parquet floor, I don't know. It came back. And from that point onwards, I became violent. Very, very violent. But particularly towards individuals who were bullying others. I couldn't take it, couldn't stand it. I didn't understand, I just went through. Moving swiftly on. I stumbled onto psychotherapy and also my black self. It was a white lecturer that introduced me to black consciousness. On a pre-conscious level, I always was aware of this Malcolm X, as they called him. P people only ever said his name in hushed tones. It's like when we're in a restaurant somewhere and we're talking and the people go, White people. <laughs> Who are you whispering for? They say they call me, and I might not seem loud today, I'm in a very humble place, but I'm just as loud as that Mr. Jasper over there. And when I go in a place, I take it to a I am begging nothing from nobody. I'm asking nothing. If I pay for my table, my chair, I do what I'm doing, and I'm not hushing my tones for nobody. Do you hear where I'm coming from? Yeah. 
psychotherapy, gestalt specifically, black consciousness, and last but by no means least, spirituality. It was a heady mix. And I remember coming to Manchester, education of black child and so on, Mint Chancellor, Williams, all the heavyweights. Ivan Van Sertema, they came before Columbus. And it grounded me. Set me on my path. It enabled me to take all of that rage and anger. Not get rid of it. When people talk to you about anger management, that's not what it's about. It's energy. That's how you channel it. I'm able to channel that energy. And the enemy can see in me. But more importantly, so can the young female and male warriors coming up. They can see that this elder is on fire. Just the way that they are. Lee hit a lot of statistics, so I'm not even going to go into all of that. Tremendous. The critical question is, right, we're fighting a war right now. It's an economic war. They look... They can't move. I mean, I'm coming from London. Let's just put this straight. 80% of us is in London anyway. It won't be like that for much longer because they're ethnic cleansing everybody out. But they can't put you nowhere. They're like, they're going to put them black white wherever they go, they cause trouble. So you know what? Stick them in these super hubs. 3,000 individuals per hub. I make them work there. Done. Finish. The Harringay when the um, fight back, as the youths then call it, occurred back in 2011, unemployment amongst the under 21 year olds was near 70%, which means to be in employment was, unor was, un was it abnormal, not normal. Nineteen young black men killed in the last 12 months between 14 and 15, depending on whose statistics you look at, in the last year. That's one a month. One a month. But that's a symptom of a much more dysfunctional, bastardized dynamic, and it's our responsibility. When Shea Kwan in Lewisham was stabbed to death, he was wearing jeans and a jogging bottom. When the paramedics come, they couldn't cut the jeans off because it was saturated in his own blood. They couldn't cut off the jogging bottom, so he bled out right there on the spot. It was on the way to the youth club that they were about to close down. Sister Sharon Hunt, you in here? Stand up, give her a round of applause. You see, these are the leaders in our community, these powerful sisters. You know how many men over the years have come to me after I've stepped off the podium and said to a whole white audience, you're all racist. Oh, Viv, I wish I could say that, but it's the mortgage. <laughs> Not the sisters, man. They will put in the work. Sharon called me up. It was a Wednesday. I was under pressure. I think I was with Leon. Some other madness was going on. She said, oh, Viv, can you come down to Lewis? And I said, look, sis, to be honest, I ain't really got the time. Oh, but there's been an incident. Can you come down? I said, I don't really want to get on the ground in the villages because of the village politics. She said, Viv, we've got a nine night. Somebody needs to come and talk to the youths. I said, what about all the other brothers down there? Lewisham? You mean you can't find one brother to come and talk to these youths? Now, any one of us who understands how these processes work know that at a point when a young man loses someone who's close to him, he's open. He's able to receive you. No, Viv, I can't get anyone. I'll name some names. I won't say them here. It wouldn't be right because it's going on film. No, they're not available. So I came down and I brought one of the youngers with me. Uh, Gwenton Slowly, let me give him, I said I was going to call his name to put energy into it. What a tremendous 32-year-old young man that boy is. Amazing. He come down with me. We went into this community centre, the same one that Shaquan was heading to when he got killed. There were 350 young black men there, that's under 21. Effectively in a state of grieving, but you know how they are, they're still on the phone, they're still laughing, but we know what's going on. I got up on the podium and I said, Firstly, I want to say that you're not responsible 
for the violence that's playing out on the street. I take personal responsibility for it today. When I said that, they all come up from the phones and started filming. <laughs> I said, me and other adults like me take responsibility for the fact that we have not kept you safe. And I give you my personal word I leave here today, I won't rest until we've done something about it. Now they have full attention. And then Gwenton got up and said what he had to say. Now I'll move on. But the critical point I'm trying to make is we can't have a situation where you've got that, oh, the actual individuals that they call elders, so 25 to 30, were outside of the community centre. They saw them come in, they saw them come out. They found the time to get there. They run the drugs in the area and so on and so forth. And we talk to them, we know who they are. But th these younger guys are looking to their so-called elders and saying, we're there, there, to look after us, protect us and give us what we need. Where are these other elders? League, de described as dusty Negroes or individuals, many of whom who are getting paid by the state to work for these young men. Yeah. Where were they? They're not there. The massive crisis in London, it feels like 2011. It feels the same energy, Lee. The same energy that we felt immediately before the kickback. So we're, frank and, it, and you can feel it in the adults as well. We called the community meeting, because two weeks later, another young man died in pretty much the same spot. He was actually coming to Shaquan's mother's shop to give some money for the funeral because she can't afford to bury her son. And in the altercation that ensued outside, won't get into the details, he ends up dead too. That's how twisted this thing is. So, spoke to Sharon, because Sharon's leading on the ground on an ongoing basis. I'm outside behind the scenes. Tell her to call a community meeting. 450 or so people turned up. Two audiences. The audience from the estate, traumatized, angry, and an audience from outside of the borough, many professionals come in to, for solutions. It was a proper rabble night, would you agree, Lee? Mm -hmm. Lee dropped our tremendous speech, you must get it online, get that circulated around. And at the end, what we did was launched um, what the establishment call a social action response. It's a more Garveyite response, it's a do for, de do for self movement, called Black Sox. Um, coined after um, a, a, a film clip that Gwenton put up online asking, uh, demanding that black men pull up their socks and sort this situation out. We've launched it, we're moving it forwards. And the very simple intention is for us to not wait for the state, the local authorities, regional authorities, central government to do whatever needs to be done. We'll generate the money that we need to generate for ourselves and we'll begin to put um, adults back on the street in key areas to provide the support that these young people require. It's critically for two reasons. It's not that there, aren't, there isn't money in the state, but when you take their money, then you have to do things the way that they want to do it. And they will never allow what you do to thrive because that's not the purpose. And most of the money now that has anything to do with our young people has police connected to it. So they also want you to inform on them. No, just keep all pan Africanists about it. We must do for ourselves. And so what I said on that night, so I put, I put my money down on the table. What's the rest of you going to do about it? You've had your old belly, everybody's spilling, spilling. Where's the money there? And we raised a, 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 a significant sum, a modest sum, and we're going to continue to move on to that. So please, join the group on Facebook. It's called Black Sox, B-L-A-K-S-O-X. Um, and the tw Twitter will come up as well. But that's not enough. That's just the beginning. Um, it's already been said, I don't want to repeat it over and over again because I think we all understand it. It's the action that we need to see. I watched some of the um, events from yesterday and I saw one young guy stand up and say, look, you know, well, why can't you people get along? Critically important. Where's the edification? Even if I don't agree with your politics, right, I can still praise you for your works. We need to praise each other, and I'm particularly the men, uh, in public, hug each other in public. So that the young, that's what the young people are seeing, bringing you back full circle to the beginning of my story. I was constantly watching what my dad was doing, 
when I saw him weakened in a certain environment, that weakened me. And that's programming me. So we need to talk less and do more. Not just out there raising money, mobilising and speaking on the podium and so on and so forth, but also just showing affection man to man. Can you hear where I'm coming from? Yeah. I can't hear you though. You don't agree? Yeah. Hug them. Hug them. Caress them. Praise them more than you praise yourself, black man. Because that's what our young people need to see going on around them all the time to counter the the toxicity that's been deliberately funneled into them on a day-to-day -day basis. We're running two capacity building training programs, which I'm financing along with the money I get from the community. On the 14th and the 21st of November, they'll be accredited. They are the best in the country because if government uses us, they must be, right? <laughs> um, they're rushing to back it because they know we're gonna run it anyway. But we don't want their money. Endorse it, but we will run it. The capacity build in two days is designed to train up 100 individuals, 100 community leaders, the Sharons of this world, and many of you sisters and brothers in the audience, right? So that we can begin to um, establish a matrix of provision across London and then begin to build on that. So the training will run on an ongoing basis. People will, in exchange for the training, which is free, give of their time put the money into our time back, so we put their time and resources into our time back so that we can sustain this thing. It will start with two things, youth provision on the ground, which ties into all the things that we were talking about, knowledge yourself and so on and so forth, economic enterprise, because I used to want to work for anybody else anyway. They're more intelligent and forward thinking than us. And there's one other initiative that we want to establish called the Nine Night, which is, will primarily be there to support um, the parents often too often just the mothers um, in those initial nine days when they don't know what's going on they don't have the resources the local authorities are roughing them up the police and so on and so forth and make sure that they get the support immediately they want to use victim support and all the other things that's their business but they would also have something that's orientated culturally and spiritually to their particular needs uh, I'm going to leave it on that point um, I just wanted to give you a message um, update you on what we're dealing with London specifically. I chose not to talk about um, Africa, lots going on. I know we're all orientated that way. Um, lots going on um, across the country. I actually advise um, government around a number of initiatives in the different cities and I wouldn't get into all of that. I just want to say we must get on and do what needs to be done and we must do that collectively. Heartened to hear uh, Lee's feedback on, on what has gone on already today and the day before. We must continue in that vein. Uh, can I get an amen? amen? Can I get a yes, sir? Yes, sir. The last point. Knife point rape has gone up by 48% in the last year. And then domestic violence, and that's the young man against his mum, against other females in the house has gone up dramatically as well. Now, that's a recorded figure what they call as inappropriate sexual behaviour amongst young black pupils is rocketed. We have to get to grips with that ourselves as a community. We need to begin to have that very difficult conversation in order to be able to address it going forwards. I want to leave that as a tone rather than expand on it, but it's definitely something that we will need to address. And hopefully it will take up a significant part of next year's conference because you know, if we're not unified in the home, we can't be unified anywhere else. All right, thank you for your time.